Hey YouTube, 5th of July, still on our truck up to Seattle. We stayed here at Camp Roberts last night and I used to actually train out here when I was a California State Army National Guard. Right now, we have a little bit of a slight delay. There's the RV and the building right behind it. We're getting some laundry done and it's gonna take a little bit longer. But fortunately, I'm gonna make the use of the time. Uh, gonna walk over couple hundred yards there is a, a really cool museum now when I would train out here it was probably between I would say 1991 and 95 is before I uh, jump ship over to the Air Force and I had probably been out here like once before with my wife Julie we cut through here to get to the coast which was a very interesting um, ride or trip of its own so um, Anyways, uh, they, the museum wasn't here, and I think there's an annex museum, but I was a cavalry scout, armored cavalry scout, so we're gonna, 19 Delta, and we're gonna see a lot of uh, armored stuff. I'm walking over a couple hundred yards, like I said, to the museum, and I should be there shortly. Um, matter of fact, I can see it through the tree line. It's right past these trees right in front of us. So as we get closer, we're on the athletic track right now, but as we get closer to the, um, uh, the museum, I was just going to say, so I'm north of San Luis Obispo, towards the coast of California. Now, when I was in the California State Army National Guard, there were, uh, I would say, four, four places that I experienced training at. I'm not saying these are all primary places. One of them was an active duty installation called uh, Fort Irwin. It's in the Mojave Desert, a uh, tank training area. That was active duty. The other three locations were primarily California State National Guard. And it was Camp San Luis Obispo, which is south of here. I trained there. The next one up the 101. And San Luis Obispo is on the 101. Camp Roberts, where we're at right now, is also on the 101. And then further up from Camp Roberts is a place called Fort Hunter Liggett. Now, the terms we use, you'll hear base, camp, fort, most of the time with my experience, bases are often referred to when you're talking about Air Force and Navy bases. Today, most camps are uh, United States Marine Corps, like Camp Pendleton, Camp Lejeune. Uh, I'm not sure if 29 Palms is actually called Camp 29 Palms, but most of the time when you hear the word camp, you think of uh, a Marine Corps installation. And then Fort would be for Army. Fort Lewis, Fort Polk, um, Fort Belvoir, Fort Irwin, Fort Ord. Actually, Fort Ord is also on the, is in Salinas here in California. It's abandoned or relinquished to the community, but there's a portion of the abandoned part of Fort Ord I'd like to check out. But, you know, you think of the word camp associated more like um, portable structures, temporary structures, tents, or uh, wooden structures that could be just moved easily camp-wise. Forts seem like more establishment. Now that's my interpretation. It may be something totally different, but when I was active duty army, everything was fort. And uh, when I was in the California Army National Guard, everything was camp. So anyways, let me turn the camera around, start showing you some of these things. So we're on the outside of the museum. This is, this, I would love to have tried to drive around one of these. Um, I was in something like a, maybe a bigger version of this. Uh, I was in a 113 armored personnel carrier. Uh, I was the driver and I have some pictures maybe I'll post on YouTube, uh, YouTube, post on Facebook. But unfortunately there's no plaques out here. Now actually this one right here, that was the one that I was in charge of. You can tell by the uh, detailed upkeep and maintenance. Um, I could buff all that out, I'm thinking, uh, a couple of blicks of paint. So actually what I think this is, I don't think this is American actually. I think this was a foreign one, or it might have been, it might have been a Sherman, but it looks like it was actually used for uh, target practice. See all those, those bullet divots in here? So it looks like it was out in the field somewhere. There was a lot of these at Port Irwin, actually, where we would just lay them out there and use them for target practice. Something's telling me that this is not U.S. made. I can ask when I get inside the museum, but the closer I look at this, I do not think that this is U.S. equipment. 
Nope. But this is kind of cool. Yeah, so why would you put a rust bucket out there like this? Because it is unique. I mean, look at these. This is just riddled. This is just riddled with, with bullet holes. <laughs> but it kind of tells you, too, this isn't pretty powerful rounds that were hitting it and whoever would have been inside their ears would have been ringing but they would have been safe from that degree that level of uh of um munitions being shot at it this one i want to, this is an m60 now this one i do know it's an m60 main battle tank this was this was the pre, uh, not the, i want to say predecessor but this was the one that was used before we have now which we call the m1 abrams now i left the army in 95 to come over to the air force so there's a lot of advancements. There's a lot of new vehicles that are around that um, I never even knew of. Oh, look like this one was target practice too. Look at this. Looks like this one. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. So it looks like this one was out in the field somewhere. But this would be the M60 main battle tank, which was the primary tank actually when I was in the army. This was I won't say cutting edge technology, but this was the thing that we would use. Oh, hold on. There's a plaque here. Let's see. No, I was wrong. I am wrong. This is the M103 heavy tank. Uh, 120 millimeter main gun. Okay, right here it says, uh, it says, these tanks never left the United States until 1972 when they were declared obsolete. <laughs> they were replaced by the M60, which had a longer range and better performance. So, um, this was before the M60, what I was saying. So, I apologize for that. That's the M103. It looked like the M60. I'd been away for a while, so my mistake. This is a Bradley fighting vehicle. There's a plaque. I saw a plaque on the other side, so let me, let me make sure I'm not making the same mistake twice. Let's swing around. Um, armored personnel. There'll be personnel inside of there. You got two, two different size uh, guns up top. So here we go. Uh, this is a prototype, uh, Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle prototype. The Bradley M2 Infantry Fighting Vehicle. In 1975, the Army had decided it wanted a new armored infantry vehicle to transport infantry soldiers on the battlefield. Now, there's more to that, more to that plaque. Um, but what I will say is that what I was in, and I don't see one out here right now. There might be one inside. But I was in a 113 armored personnel carrier, which I think I just already said earlier in the in the video. Okay, so this is a engineering vehicle, and there's a there's a little ramp to the side. I'm gonna go up there. I, I you know I hope I hope this is giving you guys something different, being that I am in the military and I'm able to get to these installations with my ID card. Now there are plenty of other museums out there that um, people without any military affiliation can go to that have vehicles like this and if you're in southern california there's the Patton. oh i see a 113 i gotta show you guys um the Patton museum which is in palm springs vicinity uh really good armored um museum there too Patton did a lot of oh here we go that's what we're looking at now so Patton did a lot of training um had a lot of training area all throughout the desert from Palmdale up to the Mojave Desert. Oh, you got to be kidding me. Well, I'm not going to go inside there. They probably probably would let you, but... <laughs> oh, what the heck. Okay, I did it. <laughs> I climbed inside this thing. <laughs> uh, so this is much different from, from the 113 I would be in. These seats go up and down, so you would have like the tank commander we sitting in here. You can retract it all the way up here. Let me show you. This is quite quite amazing. I'm not sure the level of how many crews are in here. I'm gonna show you. Some. I think three because there's three seats. So my kids should have come out here. They would have dug this. Anyways, um, so right now I'm looking through the periscopes. This cupola would actually pop up if I wanted to have my head and shoulders out, right? Right here above my hat is the cupola, a little pad there, so when you're bouncing around, you don't hit your head. But that would actually open up. You can look outside. When we were training or in combat, you say button up, and then you close everything up. And those little view holes that you're seeing as I pan around, those are like uh, periscopes, actually. That's not going directly 
out, those actually go up and over. That's actually a little periscope type of design. So if a bullet were to hit that, it's not coming through and hitting you in the face. It's uh, hitting the periscope top. There's some, looks like some belt fed ammunition area. Some controls here. Yeah, this is really kind of cool. Uh, once again, I'm at Camp Roberts. Uh, if any of you guys can come out here and check this out. So I'm going to say, I'm going to say the driver, so the driver's sitting here. I say this is the driver's compartment. So you got the one seat here for the driver. And then, you know, he has his visual stuff there. And Troop Commander TC is here where I was just standing before. It's getting really, really hot in here right now. So I'm going to jump out. And this would be the gunner's position I was sitting at originally. That would be where the ammo was kept. And, and here's the gun. Oh man, this is getting really hot in here. Okay, so I'm in the, I'm in the gunner position. And here's the gun, here's some levers. Man, a lot of buttons and switches. All right, let me, let me jump out here. I'm, I'm boiling. This is getting, wow. Can't imagine working in this. Okay, I gotta show you this. This is a trip. I was looking around. I actually found one of the periscopes loose. This is actually, I, you know, uh, let me see. See this thing I'm holding? It's actually loose. It's the periscope. So like I was saying, and those things, this is what is seen from the outside. Then way down here, wow, this is heavy. On the bottom is what we're looking through. So that's what the crew's looking through. It goes all the way up here, turn it around, and that's what you're seeing on the outside. So like I was trying to explain, if a bullet were to hit that, thinking that was going to go through and hit you in the face, it wouldn't because your face is actually way down here looking at this end of it. And this was, this was in this box. So let me put it back. Oh, wow, that's heavy. So there's a periscope, hand grenades. No, there are no, there are no, there's no hand grenades in there. So uh, fire extinguisher down there. This is a pretty well put together thing. I was surprised to find that periscope sitting there. The only thing I could think of why it's sitting there is maybe if it has to serve as a replacement if one of those were damaged. Those other ones that we were looking at, if that was a replacement periscope. I don't think that was used for hand handheld uh, operations. Really quick right here, check this out. Periscope mount. I'm not shooting this upside down. That's just the way the cupola, um, the canopy is operated. Wow! Is uh, So maybe, so it didn't hit you in the head. Uh, you'd close this up, button it down, and then you'd have to mount the periscope in there after it was closed so it didn't whack you in the head. There was the outside of the periscope area I was talking about. So once again, if it hits that in there, you're not being hit. Uh, there's a huge light up there. I want to say this was called, it's a, it's a combat engineer vehicle. It's got a big scoop in the front, but it has a gun on it that can use, be used in combat also and has a winch in the back. Okay, this is this is going. This is the M60 I was trying to uh, I was talking about before. The M60 main battle tank M60 Patton is a main battle tank MBT introduced in December of 1960. Once again, I'm not going to read this whole thing to you guys. Let me uh, let me show you at the end. So this would be the tank. This is the tank, and I apologize, I messed up on that other one. But the M60 main battle tank was the tank that uh, would have been used. It what it was in inventory when I was a 19 Delta Cav Scout. Um, like I said, that was between 19, 1990, 95. But there you go, M60 main battle tank. This is what I saw when I trained out here, either at Fort Hunter Leggett, Camp Roberts, Camp San Luis Obispo, or um, Fort Irwin, Mojave Desert. I was a scout, and this, we would go against these guys for training, like in uh, um, Op 4, Opposition Forces training. It looks like this one got shot up too. Some of these might have been a lot of target tanks. So, but there it is. Yeah, that's the main 60 main. That's the main ah, M60 main battle tank. This one here is called a Patton. This is a Patton tank, more reminiscent of uh, what you might have seen in, used in World War II. Well, let's go see if there's a thing on the back. I'm probably going to do two different video clips. This is getting on to about 15 minutes. So I'm going to do one of the outside of the museum and one on the inside. 
There's a, God, these helps on the stuff really put well together. Still got a gas tank up there. Okay, here we go. And the sun's kind of bleaching this out. Patton M47 medium tank. What years were these used? 50 cal. Um, entered service in 1952. So if anything, uh, Korea, well, but did not see any action in the Korean War. So although the Korean War was going on, was put in production, didn't see any action in the Korean War, but it might have been seen in uh, Vietnam. Although I didn't see it in there. Okay, what's, oh, here's another one you can climb in, but I'm not gonna do it. Although that was cool. That's a 50 caliber up there. Gutted out 50 caliber, I'm sure. And I didn't walk in the back to see what, what this beast of a vehicle is. Um, okay, I'm gonna guess, I'm gonna guess Sheridan. And see if it says it. Did I? Oh, nope, this is another, this is another patent. This is a patent M48 medium tank. Okay, so the other one was a heavy tank. This is a patent medium tank. Hmm, all right. <laughs> Widowmaker, how nice. Now on this one, now I think I actually rode in one of these one time. Because I remember I climbed, well, we were doing something, and one of these were out in the field, and I just wanted, and it was had a lot of room inside, all that area. It wasn't all congested like that other tank. M55, self-propelled howitzer. Also can be used, you know, this, this was more likely used to entrench himself than to do any kind of um, uh, group work effort or dig anything out for anybody else. He probably used this to entrench himself, sink himself in, and then uh, use it as an, a mobile artillery piece. Here's another howitzer, which is pretty much a cannon. Uh, this is another self-propelled one. I've actually never heard of this. I've never heard of this. I'll walk around. Oh, you can, you can climb up this one too. All right, so you get a good shot of what the inside looks like. Just make sure you got your sunblock on. I don't know if this ever was really designed to be all closed up or not. Um, and you're exposed to the elements, obviously. There's another 50 cal mounted up there. But what in the world is that? Yeah, old rusted thing. I never seen one of these, or nor I've ever heard of it. Uh, let's move over to this next guy. It's like another kind of howitzer. So the difference between a howitzer and a, and a tank is that a howitzer is more of a cannon, long range, uh, to engage ground targets, stabilized targets, maybe even buildings, troops out in the open, maybe. Um, tanks are frontline, more maneuverable, faster, uh, would engage other tanks or, or to actually be able to see the enemy. More than likely, these guys are getting a call for fire. They don't see the enemy. They're being called in for fire. Guys like me, scouts, uh, whereas tanks are pretty autonomous. They're firing on um, their own recognizance and what they see. So there's the inside of this guy. That, that well, there's a 113 over there I could show you guys, but that's pretty much close to the seating range I had when I drove 113s. Oh, there's a lot out here. I'm gonna get moving. All right, so here's another uh, self-propelled howitzer. There's also towed howitzers that you see that big deuce and a half trucks would be towing from the back. That's what this one is. This looks like another Patton, only because I read the uh, one on the other one when I made the mistake. Although it looks smaller. Well, well I'm wrong again. Boy, I'm, uh, so Walker, Texas Ranger. So Walker Bulldog, M41 light tank. Can't imagine any tank being considered light. Let me get a shot of these guys from the front. It's really hot out here today. You see there's more stuff in the background I want to hit before I close off the, uh, before I close off the, um, outside of the museum very quiet not a lot of people this is it's actually july 5th you have to 4th of july well 
<laughs> that's just simple math. It's July 5th, the day after 4th of July. Um, so the, I was surprised when we had to go to the exchange, the PX, post exchange. We went to the post exchange and um, about a squad, maybe a, a platoon of guys came in in uniform, uh, grabbing some stuff, grabbing some lunch and stuff. For us, we were, we got a down day today. One of the nice things about being in the Air Force. So this M109 howitzer, right, this is the one that I showed you in the front of the canopy or the cupola. Let's see what the inside looks like. Wow. Welcome home, boys. Jeez. Can you imagine how loud this would be in here? You'd go deaf. There's the driver's compartment up front. I showed you that from the top. All right, let's keep moving on. Okay, here we're looking at an M4 Sheridan medium tank, or what is left of it. Look at this thing. I think I thought that other one was a Sheridan. Look at the, look at the holes. What in the world was hitting this? Fast pitch baseball, maybe? Oh, man. I mean, this is... You know what's interesting? I, I have never... We used to go out and these things would be out in the field. We weren't allowed to approach them when we were doing call for fire. But some of these things would be out in the out in the field and we do call for fire with a motor platoon or artillery and out in Mojave Desert and practice. But we were never able to approach them. But you know, it's nice. It's nice to actually see some of this stuff as if it would have been in combat. And not everything you see is in pristine condition and all new and you know, you know, ready to climb inside. It's 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 kind of cool to see something busted up like this and saying what you know these things aren't uh invincible or impermeable to to uh destruction okay this looks like this is no it's not a this is very close to a 113 it's not gonna be a 113 because it looks a little bit wider and it doesn't have the trim vein in front or if it did it'd been removed uh and it has it looks like an anti-aircraft gun up there but no it's not a 113 this is very close to what I would have been in when I was a scout. Pitch is a lot bigger. It's a lot bigger. This is like Vietnam era stuff. But this one is an M59 armored personnel carrier. Entered service in 1954. So after the Korean War. This looks like a, something out of a light scout vehicle. M114 armored personnel carrier. It's a lightweight vehicle. Uh, it had a three man crew. Top speed of 35 miles per hour. I would have loved to have cruised around in that. Very, very short, small profile than what I was used to. Um, there's the front of the museum. Let me get the last few things on the outside. Okay, we, we were looking at uh, self-propelled howitzers, basically crew-driven vehicles that had the capability of a howitzer cannon. This is gonna be a, a towed howitzer that would have been pulled by um, probably a deuce and a half a bigger truck so it can also carry the ammunition. So this is an M114 towed howitzer. Uh, came into service in 1942, so this would have been something that you'd see in uh, World War II movies or documentation or documentaries. Okay, this <laughs> this dates to how old I am. When I when I joined the army in 1987, before the Humvee, <clears throat> before this guy here, that's a, that's a Humvee. I rode around on a lot of those. Uh, before the Humvee, I was in one of these, a Jeep Willie, flat fender, I was. This is what we had right here. Um, let's see, there's the description. And when I went up to Fort Lewis, Washington in 1988, we had these and something called a Gamma Goat. And this is what we had. They were painted obviously different colors. How you doing? How are you? Well, doing well. Uh, this is what we had. We would drive around in, and I didn't know how to drive it. I think they're only, I think they're only three, four, three or four speed. I couldn't drive a stick at the time, and they're all stick shift. But man, I'd like to have one of these now. I'd really like to have one of these now. But uh, then I went to Egypt. I was in Sinai, Egypt for six months for multinational force and observers, peacekeepers. Uh, summer of '88. When we came back around October time frame, 1988. Uh, in October, they had gotten rid of all these and they started bringing in the Humvees. And we wait, I'm not kidding, this is a true story. 
headquarters company probably got, I don't know, four initially. And the drivers all got trained on them. We all waited in line, like, like a carnival ride. I'm not kidding you guys, I'm not kidding. I remember I had my jump boots, brand new polished, brand new jump boots with the, with, the, with the toe cap on it. And it was my turn to jump on the Humvee just to go on around and ride. Well, I jumped in real quick and I snagged my boot on the doorway or something, put a big gouge in the leather, got all, all mad. But, uh, but after that, oh, I got sick of Humvees. We're in them all the time. You know, a month later, everyone had a Humvee. But it was such a new thing to us and very, very, you know, um, it was 1988, 88 or 89. And it was such a new thing to us. We all got excited. We wanted to ride in the Humvee. But here's the back. This one has some uh, Marine Corps markings on it, actually. I'd even like to have one of these little trailers pull behind my F-350. Uh, oh, here we go. This is, uh, no, I'm not going to say it because I'm going to mess up. <laughs> let's just, let's just have the board tell you what it is. Uh, there you go. So here we go. Well, if we go in the well, well blue, blue yonder, this is actually a lot of room in here. I, wonder, I, probably, I probably shouldn't mess with any of those. We're going down, Captain. I can't do it. We don't have the power. I'm in the back seat right now. That's a lot of button for the back seat, I'd say. So it looks like a lot of radio um, things. So maybe the radio guy sat back here. <laughs> Take one. <laughs> uh, actually, quite, quite roomy and comfortable. I'm, I'm uh, about six foot. My my head. I got plenty of headroom in here. Let's go up front. One unique thing about helicopters is that the commander or the pilot, so you do have two sticks, but like in everything else, like in your car and in an airplane, the left seater is the one in control most of the time or the main guy flying, and helicopters are the guy sitting in the right. Uh, I'm not a helicopter pilot of any of any means. Um, I haven't, I've even rode in just a few of them, but that's that's what I understand when it comes to the helicopters. Oh, what the heck, might as well sit in the seat, right? Can. All right, so here I am. Actually, the back seat was more comfortable, and that was a shot from from the outside. But so here I am, sitting in a very hot helicopter. Let's keep going. All right, so this thing here. This has got to be, I've never seen one of these. I've never seen one, never heard of one. Honestly, this thing looks very vintage, but very well put together as if it was used recently in a 4th of July parade. Very cool. Yeah, this thing looks like it's definitely an operating order to dodge. Definitely an operating order. Uh, geez, I'm gonna say World War II era. They got it put together real nice. You look at your gas can, your Pioneer tools, right there. Really nice. This is a deuce and a half. Funky, very funky deuce and a half paint job. And here's another Humvee. There's a couple of vehicles. Ooh, there's a nice. That is a nice. Here's 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 the deuce naps that I remember. Right here. Look at this. This thing is looking good. It's got a canvas cover on it. This looks like it might have been a half track. Yeah, it's a half track. I've seen a lot of these in like World War II movies. I have a little Hot Wheel of one actually. <clears throat> They did a really good job. This is, I would love to have that. That deuce and a half is looking good. Well, I'm gonna wrap up the outside portion of the uh, vlog or whatever we call it on YouTube. I was just, as I was looking at that last deuce and a half, uh, Forklift guy driving a forklift came over and he had a first sergeant emblem on his hat. Started talking and, and he was range control when I was coming out here um, as a National Guard. When I was a scout, we would fire toes and dragons, uh, 50 cals. Um, 
not range control where we're following small arms like uh, M M16s uh, or saws or M60s. We did that, I think, mostly at Fort Irwin. But, uh, okay, so I'm going to close it off here. The next, um, next video, so this is going to be, this is one of two. The next one's going to be of the interior. It'll be a little bit better lighting, uh, probably some more, you know, smaller things, obviously, other than vehicles. So, um, hope you enjoyed this portion. Check out the next portion, it'll be the inside. All right, like, subscribe, and I know I'm really deep. This is more of the adventure part. Has nothing to do with Route 66, has nothing to do with uh, my KLR 650, although it's on the back of the RV right now, but it has a lot to do with um, what I'm all, what I'm really, really all about is adventure, checking things out, loving museums, and this is really kind of a special place for me because I do retire after 31, 32 years, and that's, I retired in 2019 in just a handful of months here, and coming back here to where somewhat of the beginning of my military career had taken place, it's pretty significant, and I'm really happy to share all that with you. I wasn't expecting to be out here uh, at, at, at um, this location or, or either San Luis Obispo or Camp Roberts or Fort Hunter Liggett, but this is kind of cool to see all this and share it with you. Like, subscribe, whatever you're on, get out there and ride. Take care.